This is Ambrim Volcano. It is a remarkable wonder. Two imposing cones rise within a desert-like caldera, and where molten lakes of lava churn within their depths. For the past decade I've explored, studied and documented Ambrim Volcano across 15 expeditions. It's a notoriously difficult place to get to, and equally difficult to survive once there. And it's a volcano that has gone through unprecedented change. Ambrim is a shield volcano with a large basaltic caldera at its summit. In fact, one of the largest basaltic shield calderas on Earth. The volcano has had the highest sulfur dioxide emissions of any volcano over the past decade. And visually, it is a remarkable volcano. Prior to 2018, the volcano had multiple persistent lava lakes, unlike anything else on the planet. I've been to Amber many, many times on many incredible expeditions. Most of these involve long treks through snake-infested jungle with Amram local and very dear friend John Tusso. On other occasions, we'd chop it to the summit with fellow Kiwi and legend Jeff Mackley, before making daring rappels hundreds of metres to the crater floors to get as close to the lava lakes as possible. In front of us, we'd witness lava pulsing hundreds of metres high. The heat was unbearable. Nothing on our planet could beat this. As Jeff put it, it was the greatest show on Earth. But then, it all changed. In late 2018, I started to notice that Amram was restless. Seismicity had increased. The lava lakes started rising dramatically, and new lava lakes had formed. As I pondered these unusually large lava lakes, little did I know that just a few days later, unprecedented geological events would unfold that would completely transform Ambrim Volcano, and very disappointingly bring about the destruction of the famed lava lakes. The footage you see here was the last ever footage taken of the Ambrim lava lakes. On December 15, 2018, the lava lakes which had been persistently present for decades, drained suddenly. These photos were taken just 10 minutes apart. A few hours later, an intracaldera fissure eruption occurred, producing impressive fire fountaining and lasting approximately four hours. It produced a small cone and lava flows, which you can see on the satellite here. You'll also see nearby degassing from the existing Lemwalembwe crater. This footage was taken from a stool cooling fissure eruption just days after that eruption. On December 16th, large eruptions from both Murram and Bembo cones followed, producing ash plumes to 8 kilometers high. With the lava draining away, large voids caused massive ground deformation and subsidence. A day after, and 20 kilometers away, huge fractures began to cut through the ground. The small village of Palmer was split in half. One side had risen over 2 meters high. Surrounding coastal seafloor had also uplifted by 2 meters, creating new land and leaving marine life stranded. Large exclusion zones were set up around these fractures, fearing lava could break through at any moment. But the lava never came here. Instead, days later large pumice deposits washed up on the shore. Locals told us they had witnessed red and streaming patches out in the ocean. We even chartered a small boat in search of these. In the weeks following, the caldera area at the summit of Amram was left unrecognisable. So let's explore the geological processes that unfolded here. Why did we see the draining of the lava lakes, the fissure eruptions, the large fractures, ground uplift and pumice deposits? Well, it's important to note that Amram has two almost straight line rift zones. One running west and the other to the east, and they basically divide the island in half. What unfolded was the result of tectonically induced stresses. The process commenced with an initial shallow dike intrusion, which then triggered a larger flank intrusion in which there was a rapid migration of magma along the east of Sone, over 20 kilometres to the southeast coast of Ambrim. The partial collapses of Murram and Bembo were the result of subsidence from the removal of the shallow magmatic system beneath each cone. It's estimated that all up about 14 billion cubic feet of magma migrated in total. 
Shortly before the lava lakes drained, a series of magnitude 5 earthquakes struck, and this marked the point at which the magma began to migrate along the East Rift Zone. The first evidence of this easterly migration was the brief fissure eruption and nearby degassing of the Lembo Lembu crater, approximately two kilometers east of the Murram Cone. Over the next two days, seismicity began to also migrate further east and towards the southeast end of the island near the village of Ule. Ground measurements also showed evidence of an easterly shifting inflation. On December 17th, the magma had travelled over 20 kilometres and then continued its movement beyond land and out into the ocean before seismicity decreased relatively quickly. It was assumed that the magma had stopped its migration and lava was finally released through a submarine eruption as large pumice deposits washed up on the shore in the days after. Five years have now passed and the Ambrim volcano continues to evolve and change dramatically. I've been back every year since and have documented my observations and taken plenty of footage which I'm going to share in this video. For important context, there are two main cones at Ambrim. Murram is the largest and had the largest lava lake and a small, semi-persistent lava lake within the Embluesu crater. Murram has also two other craters to the south, a collapsed pit named Neri Embluesu Taton and was known locally as Smoky. It produced massive amounts of sulfur dioxide and water vapour and occasionally glowed red at night, but it did not have a persistent lava lake. Which between the Embluesu and Nuri Embluesu Taton is another crater known simply as Nuri Embluesu. This crater formed in 1989 and had laid dormant until 2017 when Stromboli activity was observed. It then went on to develop a large lava lake from early 2018. Bimbo is the second cone and had two persistent lava lakes, a large one and another smaller one named Son of Bimbo. Whilst Bimbo Cone wasn't as deep, nor as massive as Murram, it was certainly my favourite, and where the changes have been the most dramatic. This is what it looked like prior to events in 2018. Its crater was approximately 300 metres deep, and featured an inner tephra wall that supported a large, completely flat ash plain or plateau. And this is where we camped. Often the crater would be full of horrific gases and would be stuck in our tents with our gas masks on. Other times it would rain like crazy and form hundreds of waterfalls and even a small water lake. But it was at night when things became really magical. The entire sky would glow a hue of orange. It was undoubtedly one of the most incredible camping spots on the planet. The very first time I entered the volcano was on foot. We were near the top of the cone, peering into the crater which was shrouded in fog and gas. It was just getting dark and all we could see was an orange glow at the bottom. It looked terrifying. John, our local guide, had fashioned walking poles from sticks out of the jungle. He looked at us and said, We go down. And so without any rope or gear, we carefully made our way down a very steep crater wall to the lava lake. Now if you wanted to go any further into the crater, specialised rigging equipment was required. And so in 2015, and with the help of Jeff Mackley, we had one of our most daring expeditions to date. We made our way right to the bottom of the crater floor and just metres away from the lava lake. It was an incredibly risky undertaking descending 300 metres down inside an active volcano. And if we had fallen, we would have been swallowed up by a churning lava lake beneath us. While most of our visits to Bimbo were on foot, other times we'd fly in via helicopter. Bimbo had two large lava lakes. The main large one was incredible. It would churn and pulse lava sky high. The second was a lot smaller and had a circular, very narrow crater that funneled copious amounts of sulfur dioxide. It was very hard to get to and very hard to see the actual lava lake. On one trip, I dropped a GoPro tether to some steel wire and was one of the very first people to capture views of it. But in 2018, it all changed. The lava started draining rapidly, and then the crater floor suffered catastrophic subsidence and partial crater collapse. It produced large ash plumes reaching over 8 kilometres high. Bimbo had gone through an incredible transformation of destruction. From a distance, the Bimbo cone looks unchanged. 
But once you reach the summit and peer down into its crater, it's no longer recognizable. Here is some drone footage from 2017, and here's what it looked like in 2019. The inner tephra ring has collapsed. There have been massive landslides of the crater walls. The crater is half the depth of what it was, and the lava lakes are buried under tons of debris. There is also vigorous fumarolic degassing. A giant water course has opened up and has started eating into the plateau where we used to camp. Fast forward to today, and we see even more dramatic changes. Most striking is that Bembo's crater has turned green. Gas emissions are a fraction of what they were, and this has enabled plant life to establish and flourish. Insects are everywhere. The plateau we camped on has been ravaged by erosion, and eventually it will collapse entirely. More landslides have occurred further burying the lava lakes. But in the distance we finally have confirmation that Bimbo has sprung back to life. A new cone has been built and fresh lava flows line the crater floor. This is the first observation and footage of this new cone. On January 25th, 2022, just after 5am local time, an eruption took place in the Bimbo crater. Further eruptions followed with local villagers hearing loud explosions. At around 2.30pm, heightened seismicity was detected and a large ash plume observed in the Bembo crater. The eruption was however short-lived, lasting only just a few days. For now, Bembo remains quiet. Moving to Ambram's second cone, Murram. The Murram cone is the largest and was home to the largest lava lake on Ambram in its Mbluesu crater. At times, the lava lake swelled to three football fields in size. Here's a picture of myself next to Murrum's lava lake to give you some perspective. I spent many weeks on the volcano summit camming right beside the crater edge. The crater was absolutely colossal and was approximately 500 meters deep. Getting to Murrum's crater floor was a huge undertaking, but we did succeed. Repelling 700 meters down and then back up whilst dodging countless falling rocks was one of the most physically demanding things I've ever done. We even led a Google Maps expedition that took the Street View Tracker down and captured the entire descent in full HD. It's available on Google Maps and I'll link it in the description. What happened on Murram was particularly frightening. Our now former campsite had collapsed deep inside the crater. Here's a picture of our former campsite. And here's the aerial footage just after the 2018 eruption, showing the land under our tents completely gone. We had camped here for many, many nights, and none of us knew just how precarious that particular spot really was. Murram also suffered catastrophic subsidence and partial crater collapse. The crater is barely two to three hundred meters deep now from its original 500 meters. Unfortunately, I don't have any recent footage of Murram, and for a very good reason. The normal route up was destroyed and made impassable after the 2018 eruption. I tried my best to get there, but the cone flank was covered in a super slippery mud, and it was far, far too dangerous. Additionally, the original route led us up through a narrow gap between the Niri Mbluesu and Niri Mbluesu Taitan craters. During the eruption, the craters expanded massively and made the passage even narrower. Erosion has basically cut it off entirely. There may well be a route further south, but I haven't had the time to investigate that either. Fog and terrible weather has stopped me from flying my drone there also. At this stage, the only way to visit Murram now is from the north, via a boat to Rimvatlim. So what has happened to the Murram crater? The satellite imagery does paint a similar greenification as seen on Bembo. And like Bembo, there has also been lava emitted post the 2018 eruptions within the western part of the crater. Based on satellite data, it likely erupted in early 2020, well before Bembo's last eruption in 2022. Just south of the Mbluesu crater is Niri Mbluesu. This crater went through an incredible transformation in a very short space of time. I'd visited this crater many times, but it was always just smouldering away silently. Then in January 2018, as I was on my way to the Murram campsite, I heard large rumbling sounds. 
so I detoured and headed towards the crater. When I peered down, I was quite shocked to see new vents had opened up producing Stromboli eruptions. This activity was very unusual for this crater. I came back the next day, and just as I was setting up my drone, ash started being ejected. And soon after, it erupted, and that eruption had us running. Over the year, more thermal readings were being recorded, and then in December of 2018, not long before the major eruption, we returned to find a massive lava lake had formed. Unlike the Imbluesu crater of Murram, or even Membo crater, this crater was particularly shallow, and the lava lake was less than 150 meters below us. Like the other craters, Nuri Imbluesu's lava lake drained very quickly and underwent catastrophic subsidence and partial crater collapse post-2018. I witnessed a number of landslides when I was there, and it was a place you wouldn't want to hang around for too long. Lake Bimbo and Marim's Mbluesu crater, Niri Mbluesu has had post-2018 eruptive activity. It has formed a new cone and produced lava flows. I haven't been able to drone it yet, but it is clearly visible on the satellite imagery. And lastly, I come to the final crater, Niri Mbluesu Taitan, which is a collapsed pit to the south of Niri Mbluesu. Taitan was known as smoky to the locals as it always produced large sulfur dioxide gas and water vapour clouds, but it seldomly erupted. It was known to have a small lava pond at times. I only once got clear drone footage of it. During the events of 2018, the Taitan crater more than doubled in size, particularly to the south. Here's what it looked like before 2018, and here's what it looked like after. The southern end formed new mounds and was basically unrecognisable. But today, Taitan is perhaps the most stunning of all the craters. It's gone through the usual greenification around its surface, but the crater is now filled with a rainbow of colours. So what does the future hold for Amarin's volcano? And as so many of you have asked me, when will the lava lakes return? Well, volcanoes are unpredictable but there is some very insightful research being undertaken within the scientific community. One particular study which I will link below notes that the current magma supply rate is comparable to that before the 2018 eruption. It is high enough to promote magma migration towards the surface. What I will say is that the chances of Embrim erupting again within the next few years is high. It's not the first time that the lava lakes have disappeared, and if history tells us anything, we'll hopefully have the famed lava lakes back once again. Oh, yeah.